And that's why you need love and respect. All right. <laughs> Today we are uh, talking about divine relationships. Two weeks ago we talked about divine relationships. Love the Lord your God with all your and your and your and your. Okay, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Divine relationships. And we said that it's difficult to uh, love others if you are not loving God first. Loving God first helps us and navigates, uh, gives us grace and resource and understanding a depth of, uh, of uh, love in order to be able to love other people. And we said before we can love other people, we also need to be able to love ourselves properly. Too much love of ourselves? Well, we might know a friend or two like that. You might even be like that. Or we may under-love ourselves. In other words, we hate ourselves, and so why bother loving anybody else? So hurt people, hurt, hurt people. We talk about that. So today we're talking about another uh, level of divine relationship, and it's with the church. Divine relationship slash the church. And I've got a little opener for you there. It's a small town, had three uh, little churches, uh, and all three of those churches had the same serious problem with squirrels in the church. So each church had its own uh, fashion of dealing with their problem. So church number one decided that it was predestined for the squirrels to be in the church, yeah. so they would just have to learn to live with them. The second church decided to deal with it in a loving manner, and so they humanely trapped them and released them in the park at the edge of the town. Within three days, those squirrels rejoined their habitats. Well, the third church had the best solution of all. What did you do, the other two churches said. They said, well, we decided to vote them in as members, and now we only see them for Christmas and Easter. <laughs> A gentleman was uh, leaving church one day and he goes past the pastor and the pastor grabs him by the arm and he says, uh, you need to join the army of the Lord. And the man replied, I'm already in the army of the Lord, pastor. And the pastor questioned him, well, how come I don't see you except uh, twice a year? And the man whispered back, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> Divine relationships, the church. Sad to say, as I, as I shared those two little puns, those little jokes with you, is there is a reality, a sad reality in our country. And that is that uh, church attendance, church participation is on a rapid decline. Statistically, they will say there's about 79 to 80% of Americans who will call themselves Christian. But all across the country, on average, 20% will actually go to church. And so there seems to be a disconnect. And I did a little research and I, I found as, a, as varied and wide are, are the human experience, those are all the various and wide opinions related to why they seem to not be so interested in church and turning away. A few of the more common were, we're too busy. Literally, we are just too busy. And there is a message that's permeating some churches is that we need to dumb down. We need to slow down. We need to uh, uh, get rid of some stuff and some things. Others will say, well, I'm just too tired. I'm working several jobs. I've got kids in this club and that club. I've got so much activity going on. I'm just too tired to come to church. There are those, and I have interacted with quite a few, um, that are just self-righteous. There is no church good enough for them. They have a reason why there's a little here they like, and a little there they like, and a little there like they like. But the sum total is there's none good enough for them, so therefore they don't need church. They are their own church. And then you ask them, what happens when you have a disagreement? What happens if there's a church split? Anyways, you didn't get it. All right. <laughs> There are those that say, well, as soon as you get rid of the hypocrites, I'll go to church. And I hate to tell you this right now. I wish we'd make a little t-shirt or a little bump stick or something. But church is for hypocrites. What? That's right. I want the sick. I want the blind. 
I want the lane. I want to be the Statue of Liberty of churches and give me all your weak and weary. Isn't that what Jesus said? Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Listen, if you think you've arrived, you really haven't. Therefore, you're a... What is a hypocrite? Somebody, it's actually an old acting term. Someone who's playing a part that they really aren't. That's where it comes from. And so when people say, oh, if you give it to the hypocrites, the problem is when you walk into that church, you just ruined their population. Hypocrite number one. So we can't wait for hypocrites. Look at Jesus chose them. Probably the, the least amount of, uh, the least likely people to be in his little first church. A thief. Two, uh, two people who are boasting, you know, hey, Jesus, psst, psst, hey, let us be on your right and the left. Forget about the rest of them. Peter, you know, foot and mouth disease, Thomas always doubting. You know, I mean, quite the crowd here. Clueless. So that can't be it. Uh, there are people that are running around saying the church just isn't relevant anymore, or I'm really not that religious, or, uh, you know, I just, I haven't found one that I really like so far. There are so many opinions. There are actually people who believe that they can love Jesus, but not be attached to church. The Bible in 1 John 4, too much scripture to read just then. You've got three verses we're going to look at in another place. But he simply says, how can you say you love God who you can't see, but you hate your brother or your sister that you can see? You see, that actually, that goes on to talk about a little more. He says, if you walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We can't truly have pure fellowship with people who are walking in disobedience regarding the scriptures who call themselves born again. Not true fellowship. We can hang out. But you and I won't be on the same page, you see. It's like you have that child that always listens and that child that doesn't listen at all. You want him just to be as blessed as this one, but it's hard because he keeps making it difficult or she makes it difficult. God wants to make us all blessed, but you make it hard for him. In fact, 1 John goes on to say such a person who's, who says they can love God and not love people is a liar. You see, the church is the hope of the world. And to break it down even simpler, the church is the hope of this community. The church is the hope of this region. Social services isn't the hope of this region. Public school systems are not the hope of this region. Senior citizen centers aren't the hope of this region. What makes those beneficial at all is that there may be men and women of God, sons and daughters of the living God, who are laboring within that construct of those limited resources, trying to let their light so shine. But you know, before we had all of that, guess who provided all those services? The church. All the communities used to have a church-centered uh, operation. The church provided the food, the clothing, the education. The church provided the care. The church provided all the different systems that need, a family needed to grow and to thrive. Not anymore. We're relegated to the sidelines and we're even ridiculed for what we believe. They call us intolerant. So, so how is the church the hope? Because Jesus says that we are the light of the world. That's the church. And if the, why do you think the devil likes closing churches? He likes churches getting inward focused. Us four and no more. Why do you think he likes us getting all divided and devouring each other? Because he knows the church has got an eternal purpose. If there is a church like the book of Acts who understands the purposes of God, who understands the power of God, realizes that their presence in that community is redemptive. Right. Salvation don't come for anything else. You see, so when we want to beat on the church, we're actually beating on something completely uh, too, too big and, and, and much larger and more powerful than we might know. The church isn't man's idea. You see, there are people that think that man created it, and the reality is they did. Uh, we want to we be smart enough to understand it. Christ established it. The very first time the word church is used is with Peter, when Peter says, you are the Christ, the living, uh, the, uh, the living God. And he says, God revealed that to you, and on this rock, 
not Peter. There's a church system that thinks that Peter was the first Pope and on that and everything comes. No, on the declaration of Jesus Christ, faith in the Son of God, that's the foundation that he's going to build his church. And by the way, that's the front door to you being a part of a church like this. You can't be a, a member of our church if you haven't received Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's the beginning of all of our understanding and fellowship. That's what we share in common. We have different heritage, different lineage, different, different educational and economic situations, but when we all come through the cross, we all share something the same. That's right. Jesus Christ. Amen? And so he says, on this rock I will build my church. And guess what? And this is Matthew 16, 18. He says, and this church, the very gates of hell will not prevail. The very gates of hell will not be able to overcome you. That's the power of the church. And then in another portion, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. All authority. Say all authority. All authority. I'm sorry. Say it like you got authority. All authority. Man, say it like you're yelling at your kid. All authority. You see, the reality is, if you don't understand your authority, you will be a pathetic, purposeless church. It's not pastor's authority. It's not my authority. It's not Rebecca's authority. It's not these officers' authority. It's the authority of Jesus Christ who is the head of the church. Amen. He's the foundation. He's the head. He's the resource, the wind. He's the HVAC system. He's the power, the electronic system. Hallelujah. Amen. And sometimes he's the snow plow. Ooh. We're not even going to preach that. And then the church has an eternal purpose. Let me continue reading here. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. It's all authority in heaven and earth be given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. And I love this. Not just of a certain group of people. But disciples of all nations. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Yes. Jesus loves the little children of the world. All nations. Hallelujah. Watch this. Baptizing them and teaching them obedience. Teaching them obedience. Would everyone get saved and just immediately understand what it is to obey the word of God? That would be wonderful. What a wonderful world this would be. That's not how it happens. We all come in with our baggage. We all come in with our, with our um, overhead compartment baggage. And just like in the airport when someone wants to bring a 20 by 30 suitcase and try to call that an overhead bin carry-on, there's a human in there. Open that bag. That's what we do with the Lord. We carry carry-ons that are, that are life-size. Then we come in and say, you know, here I am, Lord. Use me. He says, okay, I'm going to use you. Just sit and learn from me a little bit. And then, by the way, why don't you go and, and I'm going to send you out with 72. And go ahead and watch what happens. And then later on, he says, all right, if you really want to follow me, you see, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner the farther and farther we walk. That's for our purpose. That's for our good. That's for the glory of God. So, and I love this scripture, Ephesians 3.10. Through the church. Through the church. That's us. That's going to be a grandiose verse I'm going to read right now. But I'm going to tell you something. We have a trouble believing it because we know us. We think we're pretty good. So we know the people next to us. And they're not as good as me. So we, we begin to interpret the scripture based on what we feel and believe right now. But watch this. Watch this. this Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. Wow. That's past you and me. God. That's beyond our little opinions and our little uh, manifestations. That's beyond our comfort zones. Through the church, the collection of people imperfect yet made perfect through Christ. A collection of people who in and of ourselves can't beat ourselves out of a plastic bag. But yet through Christ we can do all things. Through us, through all of our feebleness and weakness and fears and doubts and hindrances and opinions. Through us, something great and divine is happening in the heavenly realms. Where we can't even see it. The wisdom of God is being made known. The wisdom of God displayed through us. That is awesome, ladies and gentlemen. 
See, people of faith must realize that the church isn't our idea, and that the mission wasn't a suggestion, and that we actually do need each other to fulfill the purpose until he returns. We were talking about the other day, there used to be a time where the church was consumed with the return of Christ. And, it, and it's tended to, uh, to be observed that when churches are more cognitive of the, about the imminent return of Christ, they seem to be busier about the Father's business. That's right. They seem to be more desperate in prayer, and they seem to be more active in evangelism. They seem to not be sitting around twirling their thumbs, wondering if I could be better than the guy next to me. They seem to be busy using the gifts that God gave them to further the kingdom of God before they hear that trumpet and they start, I'll fly away in glory. The churches that don't remember the soon return, the churches that think we've got yet a hundred years, they're passive, they're powerless, they're prayerless, and they definitely don't bring people to Christ. And I gotta tell you, there's an ugly statistic that shows that an overwhelming majority of churches, Assembly of God churches in our country, did not lead one person to Christ in a year. What are we doing? What are we wasting our time on? You see, we need to understand that God established divine relationships. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 46. The whole passage is great to read, but for, for time's sake. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You see, they met together as a church corporately, and they also met together as the church in small groups. I will not uh, try to get a church that actually has church every day. You know, they met together in temple courts because they were an agrarian society. And they didn't have the same setup and system that we have today. But boy, we can at least get together once a week. Right? right? So let's say, instead of every day in the temple court, they at least met once a week in the temple court. And don't look down, but this is your temple. <laughs> it's his temple, but this is where we meet. It's our temple court. It's where we worship corporately. You see, when they did this, and I love this in the book of Acts, because it's the beginning of all things incredible here, but what it demonstrates is that the church, it gives us a place of family. Because God actually continues to refer to us as the family of God or the body of Christ. You see, sons and daughters, that sounds like a family type designation. It gives us a place of belonging. It gives us something that we can belong to that's bigger than ourselves. It gives us community. And if you don't think that, that society is scrambling for community, you are not awake. You're not watching TV. Why in the world in a beer commercial does there have to be a crowded room or a bunch of people on a couch all sharing the same similar experience? They're in community. Budweiser and Michelob, I don't know who all sells alcohol nowadays, but they use community. Look at us. We are together enjoying this fine adult beverage. Look at the Sprint commercial, or is it the T-Mobile commercial? You know, now they got all these people hanging out, and then they cut one people, one person off because they think the bill's shared, and then he says, oh no, it's individuals. So they bring the guy back. Community. We do want to belong to something. We're crying out for it. And so here's a, a little bit of an illustration. A, a Christian without a church is like a football player without a team. A soldier without a platoon. A tuba player without an orchestra. A lamb without a flock. A child without a family. In fact, there shall be some of you writing in your Bible. A Christian without a church family is an orphan. Mm -hmm. We're not called to walk alone, ladies and gentlemen. Right. We're called to be together. Mm -hmm. Iron sharpens iron. If you were to take the 56 verses that are in the scriptures about the one another isms. The church is the place in which that plays itself out. Now, not necessarily on a Sunday morning because of the constructs, but a church without a church family, a Christian without a church family is an orphan. You know why geese fly in a V formation? Not to make it easier to shoot them out of the air. 
They fly in a V formation because each bird provides uplift for the bird behind it. As they flap their wings, they're making it easier for the bird behind them. Uplift. That sounds like a scripture or word somehow. Uplifting, edifying, building each other up. So as they, as they fly in a V formation, they make it easier. And because they do this, they can travel 71% farther than if one bird tried to do it by himself. You see, the pastor visits this man who hasn't been going to church for a long time. He said he's a member of this XYZ church. The pastor knocks on the door, doesn't say a word as the man opens. He finds his seat right next to the fireplace where the man of the home sits at his chair, both enjoying the view of the fireplace, not saying a word to each other as men could do. <laughs> And then the pastor gets up, walks over to the fire, takes one log off the fire, and separates it to the farthest end of the fireplace, and sits back down in the chair, doesn't say a word. It was a matter of time, but that log, all by itself, extinguished. It burned out, it went out. The man of the house simply said, well said, pastor, I'll see you on Sunday. You see, together, we worship God bigger. Did you hear that? Together, oh yes, oh, so the lamb broke and, you know, uh, we, we, we're trying to do our... But we still worship God bigger corporately than you could do when you're up. Oh, I'm loud. I, I don't think I really can sing, but when you're not around, I'm brave. I have a good time worshiping Jesus. <laughs> but I end up singing old stuff. I don't know that new stuff. But the reality is, and that's exciting, but when we come together, woo, it's better. God just feels bigger. It seems more magnified, and that's actually what he wants. Together, we help each other grow more mature and stronger in the Lord than by ourselves. Together, we can serve and minister to more people than we can by ourselves. Many hands make light work. And with that, I want to say thank you to all the men that have been helping us this season with all the plowing and the shoveling and the cleaning. I want to start naming names and then I forget somebody and then that's it to hate me for a week. I want to thank the men who have been helping me with the heating system because we lost one of our heaters some time back. And so a handful of guys have been working on that and it should be up and going pretty soon. But in the meanwhile, they've been finding all, and fixing a lot of other things that have just not been going right. And a handful of guys. And every day when I'm in a church, and there's so much activity, I feel like you know, 10,000 people. I feel like, a, you know, wow, this is the church. We're doing more together than if we could by ourselves. Together, we can reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ yeah. than by ourselves. There's power in us. There's power in unity as we come together. That's what God wants. That's the intention, the eternal value of church. Listen, yes, church has problems. As long as there's people, there are problems. I often said the best church would be a church with no people. But then it's not the church, it's just a building. It's a tax-free piece of property. Doing nothing. What is the church? It's some total of all of us. As messed up as you are, I still love you. <laughs> I'm glad somebody's paying attention. Wow. So what does that mean for Glad Tidings Community Church? It is our prayer and our, and our uh, intention that we as a church family would realize the power and purpose of the Acts chapter 2 church. As we meet together, let's worship God bigger. Let's iron uh, sharpens iron. Let's bear with one another, praying with one another, building one another up and serving one another and loving one another. Do you know when love becomes real love? When it's hard to do it. Husband and wives know this the best. Parents know this regarding wayward children. It's so hard to love when love isn't being reciprocated. But that's when love is greatest. God so loved the world. God loved us while we were yet sinners. Greatest love in the world. Hallelujah. So we want to realize the power and the purpose of, of the Acts 2 church while we fulfill the prime directive. If you like Star Trek at all, any Trekkies in here, they had the prime directive. 
which they violated almost every episode. But what was the, what's the prime director for the church? To make disciples. Well, how do we do that? Well, that's wide and varied, hallelujah, based on the church. But ultimately, whatever we do has to have as its, as its eval moment, its evaluation observing moment, is are we making disciples? We could be making a lot of activity. We could be making a lot of bills. But are we making disciples? You see, that's the power of uh, staying to, true to the prime directive. So what does that mean for us? I've been saying since I've been here on, on, in June, uh, uh, Sunday strong. Everything we're trying to do as a church is grow from Sunday out. We have, we're working on our worship team. If you're interested in being a part of that, I'll let you connect part. We are working on our hospitality team, which has a meeting next Sunday on March 2nd. See how that worked right into the message room? Powerful. But that hospitality team, that's the first face. And boy, they're pretty faces. That's the first smile or the first hand that people coming into our church for the first time will, will receive. Tremendous, important ministry. You want to be a part of that? See Ruth, there's a meeting next week, send your bulletin. We've got our nursery ministry, which is tremendous. Uh, just working through loving on our babies. And the reason why I go in there almost every week before I come into the sanctuary to thank them, because that'll be one area of the church that I pray I'll never see the light of day. <laughs> That's why I love them so much in there. Then we have our children's ministry, which is wonderfully being, being uh, provided right now through Trish and a couple of ladies. But that is the area in our church we really, we love our children. We want our children to have the best church, uh, uh, Christian children's ministry experience possible. And so we, we are praying and trusting God and praying and, and believing that God is going to add to us. We could go that way. That's our weakest link right now. Sunday strong simply means this. If you call this your church, it's all hands on deck. If everyone had something to do, we wouldn't have to do it every week. But you would have your place and you know that you're part of this thing that God's doing. Hallelujah. The other thing about uh, growing and maturing and making disciples is how do we do that through either our Sunday school or small group experiences. And we're going to be talking about small groups even more. And we're actually launching our small groups in April, actually the week after Easter. If you come on Saturday's meeting, and that's at Jim and Rebecca's house, wait so I can see you. Okay, you don't know where they live, ask them, okay? They will tell you. The only qualification to come and, and find out what it's all about, how you can be a part of leading this thing with us, is you need to be loving God, desire to love God, and you want to love people. If you hate people, come and work in the office with me. <laughs> Not that I hate people, but I'm running that thing right now. So uh, the reality is you, you, can, you can love paper all day long. God bless you. We need you so much. <laughs> but small groups, loving God and loving people. Come and find out what that's all about. Andy Stanley says this regarding small groups. By the way, it's, it's the simple mentality of we got to get smaller as we keep getting bigger. Because Sunday morning, you cannot get what you get within a context of a small group environment. Andy Stanley says that the primary activity of the early church was one anothering one another. But when everyone is sitting in rows, you can't do one another's. Yeah. You see, when we talk about small groups, I know a lot of people are like, oh, no, oh, her. The value of the book of Acts was not only that they met together corporately, and that got limited, by the way, as persecution started to grow. Paul started addressing much more the churches that met in the homes. You see, the church grew, it got too big, and so they had to find a way to where they can keep it fresh and keep each other strong in the Lord. And so they, they, they just naturally fell into their home environments and small group environments. And so when we start talking about that, understand it's the prime directive of making disciples. It's not about another activity because we will shut down. So as we're talking about Sunday Strong and, and small groups and stuff like that, we're also talking about our church. Ushers, get ready. I just want to make a quick little appeal. This relates to our church. This relates to what God is doing here. This relates to the, the future and the vision of what God is calling this church to do. 
on Wednesday night at our annual members meeting, we pitched a simple little plan to pay down 100,000 of our mortgage. Our mortgage is 370,000 right now, due to be paid off in the year 2029. We're gonna be in outer space by then, living in little satellites and stuff. <laughs> we have a plan in one year's time, starting in March, we'd like to be able to pay down our, our mortgage by 100,000. By doing that, we save our church $88,000. And we said on Wednesday night, what could our church do at $88,000? And I didn't open the floor for ideas because there's a bazillion of them. But the reality is more gospel can be preached, more ministry can be occurred, can occur. We can do a lot instead of throwing that away to a bank. And so we're asking people, as the ushers are now going to hand these out to everyone, because nobody got these. Where's all your ushers? There you go. Come on, handsome men. That's not a qualification, which just so happens to be our men are handsome. They're going to hand one to each family member. Each family member. And I love this. Trish, again, built this card for us. But our theme this year is Make Me a Blessing. Make Me a Blessing. Pastor and I have been preaching sermons, uh, whittling at this thing. Make Me a Blessing. And here's the thing about Abraham. Abraham never withheld. And the more he gave away, guess what? The more God seemed to give him. It's just a complete crazy idea there. But in our church, we're saying, what could we do with $88,000? The sky's the limit as far as we, we're concerned. But God will lead us. And if, if you are a, a part of this church, and you want to put your hands to the plow with us, we're simply going to ask you to be a part of May be a blessing this year. And on the back of the card, there's a place for you to write a prayer of faith. Let us, again, our prayer ministry is getting stronger in this church. Let us together agree with you regarding if it's a miracle of salvation, if it's a miracle of financial blessing, if it's a miracle of marriage restoration. This particular prayer request will be held only to my, my prayer team, a small group of people who will be praying that prayer because there may be some personal stuff. It's not for the public's use. Okay, so you understand that. We want to believe God for your impossibility. We had a wall on the week of prayer, a week of prayer and fasting, and we listed all the impossibilities to us. But with God, all things are possible. Put that on here, whatever that thing is, and let us believe God. And then it simply asks you if you are going to contribute to this thing weekly, monthly, or all at once. And at the bottom, because I'm a very pragmatic person, it simply says if 50 people gave two grand in a, in a year, above and beyond your tithes. Understand that, above and beyond your tithes. Here's what it looks like weekly, 38.50. Here's what it looks like monthly, 167. Actually, it becomes a little more than 2,000. But we're asking you this week and next week, pray on this. Pray on it. And on the first week of March, and I should bring your cards in. And I should bring your cards in, your prayer requests and your pledge. We're going to take that from you at that time. Pray about it. You say, why do you delay it like that, Pastor Tim? Because I don't want emotional response because you won't fulfill your promise. And if the scripture says better, you don't make a promise. But also because I want you not to write down based on what you have right now because that's not faith. Pastor and I had some fun talking about this this summer. Faith isn't what you reasonably can expect. That's not faith, that's reason. Faith is believing what God put in your heart. Not me, not your neighbor, not guilt. What does God put on your heart? That's right. Then it's you and God. And by the way, every time we've done this, and maybe you and your walk with the Lord, every time we've done this in a campaign for a church, God didn't just meet the need of the promise, but and then some for us. God has been faithful even since we've been here, standing and trusting God by faith. God has been wonderful. I believe it. Why? We act like we're surprised. He's God. So we're going to ask you to pray about that. We're going to ask you in two weeks to bring it back, and we'll keep more in the back because some of you are going to lose it. Some of you are going to give it to the waiter today when they come to your table. I want you to believe God with us. Could you do that? Pray and believe God with us. And in two weeks we'll collect it from you. Stand to your feet. We're going to close.